Bala, Knight the Ninth, being the last. Bala, Knight the Ninth, being the last judgment. And while Sinedith Armin builded Jerusalem, weeping over the sepulcher and over the crucified body, which to their phantom eyes appeared still in the sepulcher, but Jesus stood beside them in the spirit, separating their spirit from their body. Terrified at non-existence, for such they deemed the death of the body, Loss, his vegetable hands outstretched, his right hand branching out in fibrous strength, seized the sun. His left hand, like dark roots, covered the moon and tore them down, cracking the heavens across from immense to immense. Then fell the fires of eternity with loud and shrill sound of loud trumpet, thundering along from heaven to heaven, a mighty sound articulate. Awake, ye dead, and come to judgment from the four winds, Awake and come away. Folding like scrolls of the enormous volume of heaven and earth, with thunderous noise and dreadful shakings rocking to and fro, the heavens are shaken and the earth removed from its place. The foundations of the eternal hills discovered. The thrones of kings are shaken. They have lost their robes and crowns. The poor smite their oppressors. They wake up to the harvest. The naked warriors rush together down to the seashore, trembling before the multitudes of slaves now set at liberty. They are become like wintry flocks, like forests stripped of leaves. The oppressed pursue like the wind. There is no room for escape. The specter of Anatharmon, let loose in the troubled deep, wailed shrill in the confusion, and the specter of Erthona received her in the darkening south. Their bodies lost, they stood trembling and weak, a faint embrace, a fierce desire as when two sh shadows mingle on a wall. They wail and shadowy tears fall down, and shadowy forms of joy mixed with despair and grief. Their bodies buried in the ruins of the universe mingled with the confusion. Who shall call them from the grave? Rahab and tears a wail aloud in the wild flames. They give up themselves to consummation. The books of yours and unroll a dreadful noise. The folding serpent of orc began to consume in fierce raving fire. His fierce flames issued on all sides, gathering strength and animating volumes, roaring abroad on all the winds, raging and tense, reddening into resistless pillars of fire, rolling round and round, gathering strength from the earth's consumed and heavens and all hidden abysses. Wherever the eagle is explored or lion or tiger trod, or where the comets of the night or stars of asterial day have shot their arrows or long beamed spears in wrath and fury. And all the while the trumpet sounds from the clotted gore, and from the hollow den start forth the trembling millions into flames of mental fire, bathing their limbs in the bright visions of eternity. Then like the doves from pillars of smoke, the trembling families of women and children throughout every nation under heaven cling round the men in bands of twenties and of fifties, pale as snow that falls around a lifeless tree upon the green. The repressors are fallen. They have stricken them. They awake to life. Yet pale the just man stands erect and looking up to heaven, trembling and struck by the universal stroke, the trees unroot. The rocks groan horrible and run about. The mountains and the rivers cry with a dismal cry. The cattle gather together. Lowing they kneel before the heavens. The wild beasts of the forest tremble. The lion shuddering asks the leopard, Feelest thou the dread I feel, unknown before? My voice refuses to roar, and in weak moans I speak to thee. This night before the morning's dawn, the eagle cried to the vulture. The raven called the hawk. I heard them from my forest black, saying, Let us go up far, for soon I smell upon the wind a terror coming from the south. The eagle and hawk fled away at dawn, and ere the sun arose, the raven and vulture followed. Let us flee also to the north. And they fled. 
The sons of man saw them depart in dismal droves. The trumpet sounded loud, and all the sons of eternity descended into Beulah. In the fierce flames, the limbs of mystery lay consuming with howling and deep despair. Rattling go up the flames around the synagogue of Satan. Loud, the serpent orc raged through his twenty-seven folds. The tree of mystery went up in folding flames. Blood issued out in mighty volumes, pouring in whirlpools fierce from out the floodgates of the sky. The gates are burst. Down pour the torrents black upon the earth. The blood pours down incessant, and kings in their palaces lie drowned. Shepherds, their flocks, their tents, roll down the mountains in black torrents. Cities, villages, high spires and castles, drowned in the black deluge. Shoal on shoal float the dead carcasses of men and beasts, driven to and fro on waves of foaming blood beneath the black incessant sky, till all mysteries tyrants are cut off and not one left on earth. And when all tyranny was cut off from the face of the earth, around the dragon form of Urizen and round his stony form, the flames rolling intense through the wild universe began to enter the holy city. Entering, the dismal clouds and furrow lightnings break their way, the wild flames licking up the bloody deluge, living flames winged with intellect and reason round the earth, they march in order, flame by flame, from the clotted gore and from the hollow den. Start forth the trembling millions into flames of mental fire, bathing their limbs in the bright visions of eternity. Beyond this universal confusion, beyond the remotest pole where the vortexes begin to operate, there stands a horrible rock far in the south. It was forsaken when Urizen gave the horses of light into the hands of Luva. In this rock lay the faded head of the eternal man and wrapped around with weeds of death. Pale, cold, in sorrow and woe, he lifts the blue lamps of his eyes and cries with heavenly voice. Bowing his head over the consuming universe, he cried, A weakness and a weariness, a war within my members. My sons, exiled from my breast, pass to and fro before me. My birds are silent on my hills. Flocks die beneath my branches. My tents are fallen. My trumpets and the sweet sounds of my harp is silent on my clouded hills that belch forth storms and fires. My milk of cows and honey of bees and fruit of golden harvest are gathered in the scorching heat and in the driving rain. My robe is turned to confusion and my bright gold to stones. Where once I sat, I weary walk in misery and pain. For from within my withered breast, grown narrow with my woes, the corn is turned to thistles and the apples into poison. The birds of song to murderous crows, my joys to bitter groans. The voices of children in my tents and to cries of helpless infants, and all exiled from the face of light and shine of morning. In this dark world, a narrow house, I wander up and down. I hear mystery howling in these flames of consummation. When shall the man of future times become as in days of old? In weary life, why sit I here and give up all my powers to indolence, to the night of death when indolence and mourning sit hovering over my dark threshold? Though I arise, look out and scorn the war within my members, yet my heart is weak and my head faint. Yet will I look out into the morning, whence is the sound of rage of men drinking each other's blood, drunk with the smoking gore and red, but not with nourishing wine. The eternal man sat on the rocks and cried with awful voice, O Prince of Light, where art thou? I behold thee, not as once in the eternal fields and clouds of morning stepping forth with harps and songs, where bright Ahania sang before thy face, and all thy sons and daughters gather round my ample table. See you not all this racking, furious confusion? Come forth from slumbers of thy cold abstraction. Come forth, rise to eternal births. Shake off thy cold repose. Schoolmaster of souls, great opposer of change, arise, that the eternal worlds may see thy face in peace and joy, that thou dread form of certainty may sit in town and village, or little children play around thy feet in gentle awe, fearing thy frown, loving thy smile. 
You're as in Prince of Light. He called. The deep buried his voice in answer, none returned. Then wrath burst round. The eternal man was wrath. Again he cried, Arise, O stormy form of death, O dragon of the deeps, lie down before my feet. O dragon, let yours and arise. Well, how couldst thou deform those beautiful proportions of life in person? For as a person is, so is his life proportioned. Well, Luva rage in the dark deep, even a consummation. For if thou feedst not his rage, it will subside in peace. But if thou darest obstinate refuse my stern behest, thy crown and scepter I will seize and regulate all my members in stern severity and cast thee out into the indefinite where nothing lives, there to wander. And if thou returnst weary weeping at the threshold of existence, I will steal my heart against thee to eternity and never receive thee more. Thy self-destroying beast form science shall be thy eternal lot. My anger against thee is greater than against this Luva, for war is energy enslaved. But thy religion, the first author of this war, and the distracting of honest minds and the confused perturbation and strife, and honor and pride is a deceit so detestable that I will cast thee out if thou repentest not, and leave thee as a rotten branch to be burned with mystery the harlot and with Satan forever and ever. Error can be redeemed in all eternity, but sin, even Rahab, is redeemed in blood and fury and jealousy. The line of blood that stretched across the windows of the morning, redeemed from error's power. Wake, thou dragon of the deeps. Yours and wept in the dark deep, anxious his scaly form to reassume the human, and he wept in the dark deep saying, Oh, that I had never drank the wine, nor eat the bread of dark mortality, nor cast my view into futurity, nor turn my back, darkening the present, clouding with a cloud and building arches high in cities, turrets, and towers, and domes, whose smoke destroyed the pleasant gardens, and whose running kennels choked the bright rivers, burdening with my ships the angry deep, through chaos, seeking for a little delight, and in spaces remote, seeking the eternal, which is always present to the wise, seeking the pleasure that unsought falls round the infant's path, and on the fleeces of mild flocks would neither care nor labor. But I, the labor of ages, whose unwearied hands are thus deformed with hardness, with the sword and with the spear and with the chisel and the mallet, I, whose labors vast, order the nations, separating family by family, alone enjoy not. I alone, in misery supreme, ungratified, give all my joy unto this Luva and Vala. And go, dark futurity, I will cast thee forth from those heavens of my brain, nor will I look upon futurity more. I cast futurity away and turn my back upon that void which I have made. For lo, futurity is in this moment. Let orc consume, let Tharmas rage, let darker Thona give all strength to loss and Anatharman, and let loss self-cursed rend down this fabric as a wall ruined and family extinct. Rage, orc, rage, Tharmas, yours and no longer curbs your rage. So yours and spoke. He shook his snows from off his shoulders and arose as on a pyramid of mist his white robes scattering. The fleecy white renewed, he shook his aged mantles off into the fires. Then glorious bride, exulting in his joy, he sounding rose into the heavens in naked majesty and radiant youth. When low like gardens in the eastern sky, when vocal May comes dancing from the east, a Hania came exulting in her flight as when a bubble rises up on the surface of a lake, a Hania rose in joy. Excess of joy is worse than grief. Her heart beat high. Her blood burst its bright vessels. She fell down dead at the feet of Urizen, outstretched, a smiling course. They buried her in a silent cave. Yours and dropped a tear. The eternal man darkened with sorrow. The three daughters of Urizen guard Ahania's death couch. Rising from the confusion in tears and howlings and despair, calling upon their father's name upon the river's dark. And the eternal man said, 
Hear my words, O Prince of Light. Behold Jerusalem, in whose bosom the Lamb of God is seen, though slain. Before her gates he self-renewed remains eternal, and I through him awake to life from death's dark veil. The times revolve. The time is coming when all these delights shall be renewed, and all these elements that now consume shall reflourish. The bright Ahania shall awake from death, a glorious vision to thine eyes, a self-renewing vision. The spring, the summer, to be thine. Then sleep the wintry days in silk and garments spun by her own hands against her funeral. The winter thou shalt plow and lay thy stores into thy barns, expecting to receive a hania in the spring. Joy, immortal thou. Regenerate she and all the lovely sex from her shall learn obedience and prepare for a wintry grave. The spring may see them rise in tenfold joy and sweet delight. Thus shall the male and female live the life of eternity because the Lamb of God creates himself a bride and wife that we as children evermore may live in Jerusalem which now descendeth out of heaven, a city yet a woman, mother of myriads redeemed and born in her spiritual palaces by a new spiritual birth, regenerated from death. Yours and said, I have erred and my error remains with me. What chain encompasses? In what lock is the river of light confined that issues forth in the morning by measure, in the evening by carefulness? Or shall we take our stand to view the infinite and the unbounded, or where the human feet? For lo, our eyes are in the heavens. He ceased, for riven link from link, the bursting universe explodes. All things reversed flew from their centers, rattling bones to bones join. Shaking convulsed, the shivering clay breathes. Each speck of dust to the earth's center nestles round and round in pangs of an eternal birth in torment and awe and fear. All spirits deceased, let loose from reptile prisons, come back in shoals. Wild furies from the tiger's brain and from the lion's eyes and from the ox and ass come moping terrors, from the eagle and raven, numerous as the leaves of autumn. Every species flock to the trumpet, muttering over the sides of the grave and crying in the fierce wind round. Heaving rocks and mountains filled with groans and rifted rocks suspended in the air by inward fires. Many a woeful company and many on clouds and waters, friends and fathers, mothers and infants, kings and warriors, priests and chained captives met together in a horrible fear, and every one of the dead appears as he had lived before, and all the marks remain of the slave's scourge and tyrant's crown, and of the priest's overgorged abdomen, and of the merchant's thin sinewy deception, and of the warriors outbraving in thoughtlessness, in lineaments too extended, and in bones too straight and long. They show their wounds, they accuse, they seize the oppressor. Howlings began on the golden palace, songs of joy on the desert. The cold babe stands in the furious air. He cries, the children of 6,000 years who died in infancy, rage furious, a mighty multitude rage furious, naked and pale, standing on the expecting air to be delivered. Rend limb from limb the warrior and the tyrant reuniting in pain. The furious wind still rends about. They flee in sluggish effort. They beg, they entreat in vain. Now they listen not to entreaty. They viewed the flames red rolling on through the wide universe from the dark jaws of death beneath and desolate shores remote. These covering vaults of heaven and these trembling globes of earth. One planet calls to another and one star inquires of another. What flames are these coming from the south? What noise? What dreadful rout is of a battle in the heavens? Hark, heard you not the trumpet as a fierce battle? While they spoke, the flames came on, intense roaring. They see him whom they have pierced. 
They wail because of him. They magnify themselves no more against Jerusalem, nor against her little ones. The innocent accused before the judges shines with immortal glory. Trembling, the judge springs from his throne, hiding his face in the dust beneath the prisoner's feet, and saying, Brother of Jesus, what have I done? Entreat thy Lord for me, perhaps I may be forgiven. While he speaks, the flames roll on, and after the flames appears the cloud of the Son of Man descending from Jerusalem with power and great glory. All nations look up to the cloud and behold him who was crucified. The prisoner answers, You scourge my father to death before my face while I stood bound with cords and heavy chains. Your hypocrisy shall now avail you not. So speaking, he dashed him with his foot. The cloud is blood dazzling upon the heavens, and in the cloud above it, upon its volumes is beheld a throne and a pavement of precious stones, surrounded by twenty-four venerable patriarchs, and these again surrounded by four wonders of the Almighty, incomprehensible, pervading all amidst and round about. Four star each and the other reflected. They are named lives and eternity. Four star universes going forward from eternity to eternity. And the fallen man who has arisen upon the rock of ages beheld the vision of God. And he arose up from the rock. And yours and arose up with him, walking through the flames to meet the Lord coming in judgment. But the flames repelled them still to the rock. In vain they strove to enter the consummation together. For the redeemed man could not enter the consummation. Then they seized the sons of yours in the plow. They polished it from rust of ages. All its ornaments of gold and silver and ivory reshone across the field immense, where all the nations darken like mold in the divided fallows, where the weed triumphs in its own destruction. They took down the harness from the blue walls of heaven, starring, jingling, ornamented with beautiful art, the study of angels, the workmanship of demons, when heaven and hell in emulation strove in sports of glory. The noise of rural work resounded through the heaven of heavens. The horses neigh from the battle, the wild bulls from the sultry waste, the tigers from the forest, and the lions from the sandy deserts. They sing, they seize the instruments of harmony. They throw away the spear, the bow, the gun, the mortar. They level the fortifications. They beat the iron engines of destruction into wedges. They give them to yours and sons, ringing the hammer's sound in dens of death to forge the spade, the mattock, and the axe, the heavy roller to break the clods to pass over the nations. The sons of Urizen shout, their father rose. The eternal horse's harness they called to Urizen. The heavens moved at their call. The limbs of Urizen shone with ardor. He laid his hand on the plow. Through dismal darkness drave the plow of ages over cities and over all their villages, over mountains and all their valleys, over the graves and caverns of the dead over the planets and over the void spaces, over sun and moon and star and constellation. Then yours and commanded, and they brought the seed of men. The trembling souls of all the dead stood before yours and weak wailing in the troubled air, east, west, and north and south. He turned the horses loose and laid his plow in the northern corner of the wide universal field and stepped forth into the immense. Then he began to sow the seed. He girded round his loins with a bright girdle and his skirt filled with immortal souls. Howling and wailing, fly the souls from yours in strong hand. For from the hand of yours in the myriads fell like stars into their own appointed places, driven back by the winds. The naked warriors rush together down to the seashores. They are become like wintry flocks, like forests stripped of leaves. The kings and princes of the earth cry with a feeble cry, driven on the unproducing sands and on the hardened rocks. And all the while the flames of Orc follow the venturous feet of Urizen. And all the while the trump of Tharmas sounds. Weeping and wailing fly the souls from Urizen's strong hand. The daughters of Urizen stand with cups and measures of foaming wine, immense upon the heavens with bread and delicate repasts. 
Then follows the golden arrow in the midst of mental fires, to ravishing melody of flutes and harps and softest voice. The seed is harrowed in while flames heat the black mold and cause the human harvest to begin. Towards the south first sprang the myriads, and in silent fear they look out from their graves. And Urizen sits down to rest, and all his wearied sons take the repose on beds. They drink, they sing, they view the flames of orc and joy, they view the human harvest springing up, a time they give to sweet repose, to all the harvest is ripe. And lo, like the harvest moon, Ahania casts off her death clothes. She folded them up in care and silence, and her brightening limbs bathed in the clear spring of the rock, then from her darksome cave issued in majesty divine. Yurzen rose up from his couch on wings of tenfold joy, clapping his hands, his feet, his radiant wings in the immense, as when the sun dances upon the mountains. A shout of jubilee and lovely notes responding from daughter to daughter, from son to son, as if the stars beaming innumerable through night should sing soft warbling, filling earth and heaven. And bright Ahania took her seat by yours and in songs and joy. The eternal man also sat down upon the couches of Beulah, sorrowful that he could not put off his new risen body in mental flames. The flames refused, they drove him back to Beulah, his body was redeemed to be permanent through mercy divine. And now fierce orc had quite consumed himself in mental flames, expending all his energy against the fuel of fire. The regenerate man stooped his head over the universe, and in his holy hands received the flaming demon and demoness of smoke, and gave them to Urizen's hand. The mortal frowned, saying, Luva and Vala, henceforth you are servants. Obey and live. You shall forget your former state. Return a love and peace into your place, the place of seed, not a brain or heart. If gods combine against men, setting their dominions above the human form divine, thrown down from their high station in the eternal heavens of human imagination, buried beneath in dark oblivion with incessant pangs, ages on ages, and enmity and war, first weakened then in stern repentance, they must renew their brightness, and their disorganized functions must again reorganize till they resume the image of the human cooperating in the bliss of man, obeying his will, servants to the infinite and eternal of the human form. Luvenvala descended and entered the gates of dark Thona, and walked from the hands of Urizen in the shadows of Vala's garden, where the impressions of despair and hope forever vegetate in flowers and fruits and fishes, birds and beasts and clouds and waters, the land of doubts and shadows, sweet delusions, unformed hopes. They saw no more the terrible confusion of the racking universe. They heard not, saw not, felt not all the terrible confusion. For in their orb senses within, closed up, they wandered at will. And those upon the couches viewed them in the dreams of Beulah as they reposed from the terrible wide universal harvest. Invisible Luva and bright clouds hovered over Vala's head, and thus their ancient golden age renewed. For Luva spoke with voice mild from his golden cloud upon the breath of morning. Come forth, O Vala, from the grass and from the silent dew. Rise from the dews of death, for the eternal man is risen. She walks among flowers and looks toward the eastern clearness. She walks, yea, runs. Her feet are winged on the top of the bending grass. Her garments rejoice in the vocal wind, and her hair glistens with dew. She answered thus, Whose voice is this in the voice of the nourishing air, in the spirit of the morning, awakening the soul from its grassy bed? Where dost thou dwell? For it is thee I seek, and but for thee I must have slept eternally, nor have felt the dew of the morning. Look how the opening dawn advances with vocal harmony. Look how the beams foreshow the rising of some glorious power. The sun is thine. He goes forth in his majestic brightness. O thou creating voice that callest, and who shall answer thee? Where dost thou flee, O fair one? Where dost thou seek thy happy place? To yonder brightness there I haste, for sure I came from thence. 
or else I must have slept eternally, nor have felt the dew of morning. Eternally thou must have slept, nor have felt the morning dew, but for yon nourishing sun, tis that by which thou art arisen. The birds adore the sun, the beasts rise up and play in his beams, and every flower and every leaf rejoices in his light. Then, O thou fair one, sit thee down, for thou art as the grass. Thou risest in the dew of morning, and at night are folded up. Alas, am I but a flower? Then will I sit me down, then will I weep, then I'll complain and sigh for immortality, and chide my maker, thee, O son, that raised me to fall. So saying, she sat down and wept beneath the apple trees. O be thou blotted out, thou son, that raised me to trouble, that gavest me a heart to crave, and raised me thy phantom, to feel thy heat and see thy light, and wander here alone. Hopeless I am like the grass, and so shall pass away. Rise, sluggish soul, why sit'st thou here? Why dost thou sit and weep? Yon sun shall wax old and decay, but thou shalt ever flourish. The sun shall ripen and fall down, and the flowers consume away, but thou shalt still survive. Rise, O oh, dry thy dewy tears. <sighs> shall I still survive? Whence came that sweet and comforting voice, and whence that voice of sorrow? O oh, son, thou art nothing to me now. Go on thy course rejoicing, and let us both rejoice together. I walk among his flocks and hear the bleeding of his lambs. Oh, that I could behold his face and follow his pure feet. I walk by the footsteps of his flocks. Come hither, tender flocks. Can you converse with the pure soul that seeketh for her maker? You answer not. Then I am your set your mistress in this garden. I watch you and attend your footsteps. You are not like the birds that sing and fly in the bright air, but you do lick my feet and let me touch your woolly backs. Follow me as I sing, for in my bosom a new song arises to my Lord. Rise up, O sun, most glorious minister and light of day. Flow on, ye gentle airs, and bear the voice of my rejoicing. Wave freshly clear waters flowing down around the tender grass, and thou sweet-smelling ground, put forth thy life in fruits and flowers. Follow me, O my flocks, and hear me sing my rapturous song. I will cause my voice to be heard on the clouds that glitter in the sun. I will call, and who shall answer me? I will sing, who shall reply? For from my pleasant hills, behold, the living, living springs running from my green pastures, delighting all my trees. I am not here alone, my flocks. You are my brethren, and you birds that sing and adorn the sky. You are my sisters. I sing, and you reply to my song. I rejoice, and you are glad. Follow me, O my flocks. We will descend into the valley. Oh, how delicious are the grapes, and they're flourishing in the sun. How clear the spring of the rock running along the golden sand. How cool the breezes of the valley in the arms of the branchy trees. Cover us from the sun. Come and let us sit in the shade. My Luva here hath placed me in a sweet and pleasant land and given me fruits and pleasant waters and warm hills and cool valleys. Here will I build myself a house and here I'll call on his name. Here I'll return when I am weary and take my pleasant rest. So spoke the sinless soul, and laid her head on the downy fleece of a curled ram, who stretched himself in sleep beside his mistress, and soft sleep fell on her eyelids in the silent noon of day. Then Luva passed by, and saw the sinless soul, and said, Let a pleasant house arise to be the dwelling place of this immortal spirit growing in lower paradise. He spoke, and pillars were builded, and walls as white as ivory. The grass she slept on was paved with pavement as of pearl. Beneath arose a downy bed and a ceiling covered all. Val awoke. When in the pleasant gates of sleep I entered, I saw my Luva like a spirit stand in the bright air. Round him stood spirits like me who reared me a bright house. And here I see the house remain in my most pleasant world. My Luva smiled. I kneeled down. He laid his hand on my head. And when he laid his hand upon me, from the gates of sleep I came into this bodily house to tend my flocks in my pleasant garden. So saying, she arose and walked around her beautiful house, 
And then from her white door she looked to see her bleeding lambs, but her flocks were gone up from beneath the trees into the hills. I see the hand that leadeth me doth also lead my flocks. She went up to the flocks and turned off to see her shining house. She stooped to drink the water of the clear spring and eat the grapes and apples. She bore the fruits in her lap. She gathered flowers for her bosom. She called to her flocks, saying, Follow me, O my flocks. They followed her to the silent valley beneath the spreading trees, and on the river's margin she ungirded her golden girdle. She stood in the river and viewed herself within a watery glass, and her bright hair was wet with the waters. She rose up from the river, and as she rose, her eyes were open to the world of waters. She saw Tharmas sitting upon the rocks beside the wavy sea. He stroked the water from his beard and mourned faint through the summer veils. And Vala stood on the rocks of Tharmas and heard his mournful voice. O Anian, my weary head is in the bed of death, for weeds of death have wrapped around my limbs in the hoary deeps. I sit in the place of shells and mourn, and thou art closed on clouds. When will the time of clouds be passed in the dismal night of Tharmas? Arise, O Anian, arise and smile upon my head, as thou dost smile upon the barren mountains, and they rejoice. When wilt thou smile on Tharmas, O thou bringer of golden day? Arise, O Anian, arise, for lo, I have calmed my seas. So saying, his faint head, he laid upon the oozy rock, and darkness covered all the deep. The light of Anian faded like a faint flame quivering upon the surface of the darkness. Then Vala lifted up her hands to heaven to call on Anian. She called, but none could answer her, and the echo of her voice returned. Where is the voice of God that called me from the silent dew? Where is the Lord of Vala that does hide in clefts of the rock? Why shouldst thou hide thyself from Vala, from the soul that wanders desolate? She ceased, and light beamed round her like the glory of the morning, and she rose out of the river and girded on her golden girdle. And now her feet step on the grassy bosom of the ground among her flocks, and she turned her eyes toward her little pleasant house and saw in the doorway beneath the trees two little children playing. She drew near to her house, and her flocks followed her footsteps. The children clung around her knees. She embraced them and wept over them. Thou, little boy, art Tharmas, and thou, bright girl, Anian. How are you thus renewed and brought into the gardens of Vala? She embraced them in tears till the sun descending the western hills, and then she entered her bright house, leading her mighty children. And when night came, the flocks lay down around the house beneath the trees. She laid the children on the beds which she had saw prepared in the house, then laid herself down and closed her eyelids in soft slumbers. And in the morning, when the sun arose in the crystal sky, Vala awoke and called the children from their gentle slumbers. Awake, O Anian, awake, and let thine innocent eyes enlighten all the crystal house of Vala. Awake, awake. Awake, Tharmas, awake, awake, thou child of dewy tears. Open the orbs of thy blue eyes and smile upon my gardens. The children woke and smiled on Vala. She kneeled by the golden couch. She pressed them to her bosom and her pearly tears dropped down. O oh, my sweet children, Anian, let Tharmas kiss thy cheek. Why dost thou turn thyself away from his sweet watery eyes? Tharmas, henceforth in Vala's bosom thou shalt find sweet peace. Bless the lovely eyes of Tharmas and the eyes of Enion. They rose, they went out, wandering, sometimes together, sometimes alone. And why weeps thou, Tharmas, child of tears, in the bright house of joy? Doth Enion avoid the sight of thy blue heavenly eyes? And dost thou wander with thy lambs and wet their innocent faces with thy bright tears, because the steps of Enion are in the gardens? Rise, sweet boy, and let us follow the path of Enion. So saying, they went down into the garden among the fruits, and Enion sang among the flowers that grew around among the trees. And Vala said, Go, Tharmas, weep not. Go to Enion. And he said, O Vala, I am sick, and all this garden of pleasure swims like a dream before my eyes. But the sweet-smelling fruit revives me to new deaths. 
I fade even like a water lily in the sun's heat, till in the night on the couch of Ennian I drink new life and feel the breath of sleeping Ennian. But in the morning she rises to avoid my eyes, and my loins fade, and in the house I sit me down and weep. Cheer up thy countenance, bright boy, and go to Ennian. Tell her that Vala waits her in the shadows of her garden. He went with timid steps, and Ennian, like the ruddy morn when infant spring appears in swelling buds and opening flowers behind her veil withdraws, so Ennian turned her modest head. But Tharmas spoke, Vala seeks thee, sweet Ennian, in the shades. Follow the steps of Tharmas, O thou brightness of the gardens. He took her hand. Reluctant, she followed in infant doubts. Thus an eternal childhood straying among Vala's flocks in infant sorrow and joy alternate, Ennian and Tharmas played round Vala in the gardens of Vala and by a river's margin. They are the shadows of Tharmas and of Ennian in Vala's world. And the sleepers who rested from their harvest work beheld these visions. Thus were the sleepers entertained upon the couches of Beulah. When Louv and Val were closed up in the world of shadowy forms, darkness was all beneath the heavens. Only a little light, such as glows out from sleeping spirits, appeared in the depths beneath. As when the wind sweeps over a cornfield, the noise of souls through all the immense, bore down by clouds swagging in autumnal heat, muttering along from heaven to heaven, hoarse roll the human forms beneath thick clouds. Dreadful lightnings burst and thunders roll. Down pour the torrent floods of heaven on all the human harvest. Then Urizen, sitting in his repose on beds in the brightest south, cried, Times are ended. He exulted. He arose in joy. He exulted. He poured his light, and all his sons and daughters poured their light to exhale the spirits of Vala and Luva through the atmosphere. And Luva and Vala saw the light. Their spirits were exhaled in all their ancient innocence. The floods depart, the clouds dissipate or sink into the sea of Tharmas. Luva sat above in the bright heavens in peace. The spirits of men beneath cried out to be delivered, and the spirit of Luva wept over the human harvest and over Vala, the sweet wanderer. In pain the human harvest waved in horrible groans of woe. The universal groan went up. The eternal man was darkened. Then Urizen arose and took his sickle in his hand. But there's a brazen sickle and a sickle of iron hid deep in the south, guarded by a few solitary stars. This sickle Urizen took, the scythe his sons embraced, and went forth and began to reap. And all his joyful sons reaped the wide universe and bound in sheaves a wondrous harvest. They took them into their wide barns with loud rejoicings and triumph of flute and harp and drum and trumpet, horn and clarion. The feast was spread in the bright south, and the regenerate man sat at the feast, rejoicing, and the wine of eternity was served round by the flames of Luva all day and all the night. And when morning began to dawn upon the distant hills, a whirlwind rose up in the center, and in the whirlwind a shriek, and in the shriek a rattling of bones, and in the rattling of bones a dolorous groan, and from the dolorous groan in tears rose Ennian like a gentle light. And Ennian spoke, saying, O oh, dreams of death, the human form dissolving, accompanied by beasts and worms and creeping things in darkness and despair. The clouds fall off from my wet brow, the dust from my cold limbs into the sea of Tharmas. Soon renewed, a golden moth, I shall cast off my death clothes and embrace Tharmas again. For lo, the winter melted away upon the distant hills, and all the black mold sings. She speaks to her infant race. Her milk descends down on the sand, and the thirsty sand drinks and rejoices, wondering to behold the emmet, the grasshopper, the jointed worm. The roots shoot thick through the solid rocks, bursting their way. They cry out in joys of existence. The broad stems rear on the mountain, stem after stem. The scaly newt creeps from the stone, and the armed fly springs from his rocky crevice. The spider and the bat burst from the hardened slime, crying to one another, What are we, and where is our joy and delight? Lo, the little moss begins to spring, and the tender weed creeps round our secret nest. 
Flocks brighten the mountains. Herds throng up the valley. Wild beasts fill the forests. Joy thrilled through all the furious form of Tharmas, humanizing. Mild he embraced her whom he sought. He raised her through the heavens, sounding his trumpet to awaken the dead. On high he soared over the ruined worlds, the smoking tomb of the eternal prophet. The eternal man arose. He welcomed them to the feast. The feast was spread in the sweet south, and the eternal man sat at the feast rejoicing, and the wine of eternity was served round by the flames of Luva all day and all the night. And many eternal men sat at the golden feast to see the female form now separate. They shuddered at the horrible thing, not born for the sport and amusement of man, but born to drink up all his powers. They wept to see their shadows. They said to one another, this is sin. This is the generative world. They remembered the days of old. And one of the eternals spoke, all was silent at the feast. Man is a worm wearied with joy. He seeks the caves of sleep among the flowers of Beulah in his selfish cold repose, forsaking brotherhood and universal love in selfish clay, folding the pure wings of his mind, seeking the places dark, abstracted from the roots of science, that enclosed around in walls of gold, we cast him like a seed into the earth till times and spaces have passed over him. Duly every morn we visit him, covering with a veil the immortal seed. With windows from the inclement sky we cover him, and with walls and hearths protect the selfish terror, till divided all in families we see our shadows born. And thence we know that man subsists in brotherhood and universal love. We fall on one another's necks. More closely we embrace, for not for ourselves, but for the eternal family we live. Man liveth not by self alone, but in his brother's face each shall behold the eternal Father, and love and joy abound. And so spoke the eternal at the feast. They embraced the newborn man, calling him brother, image of the eternal Father. They sat down at the immortal table, sounding loud their instruments of joy, calling the morning into Beulah. And the eternal man rejoiced. When morning dawned, the Eternals rose to labor at the vintage. Beneath they saw their sons and daughters, wondering, inconceivable, at the dark myriads and shadows in the worlds beneath. In the morning dawned, yours and rose, and in his hand the flail sounds on the floor, heard terrible by all beneath the heavens, dismal, loud, redounding. The nether floor shakes with the sound, and all nations were threshed out, and the stars threshed from their husks. Then Tharmas took the winnowing fan. The winnowing wind, furious above, feared round by the violent whirlwind driven west and south, tossed the nations like chaff into the seas of Tharmas. No mystery fierce, Tharmas cries, behold, thy end is come. Art thou she that made the nations drunk with the cup of religion? Go down, ye kings and counselors and giant warriors. Go down into the depths. Go down and hide yourselves beneath. Go down with horse and chariots and trumpets of horse war. Lo, how the pomp of mystery goes down into the caves. Her great men howl and throw the dust and rend their hoary hair. Her delicate women and children shriek upon the bitter wind, spoiled of their beauty, their hair rent, and their skin shriveled up. Lo, darkness covers the long pomp of banners and the wind, and black horses and armed men and miserable bound captives. Where shall the graves receive them all? And where shall be their place? And who shall mourn for mystery who never loosed her captives? With the slave grinding at the mill, run out into the field. Let him look up into the heavens and laugh in the bright air. Let the enchained soul shut up in darkness and in sighing, whose face has never seen a smile in thirty weary years, rise up and look out. His chains are loose, his dungeon doors are open. And let his wife and children return from the oppressor's scourge. They look behind at every step and believe it is a dream. Are these the slaves that groaned along the streets of mystery? Where are your bonds and taskmasters? Are these the prisoners? Where are your chains? Where are your tears? Why do you look around? 
If you are thirsty, there is the river. Go bathe your parched limbs. The good of all the land is before you, for mystery is no more. And all the slaves from every earth in the wide universe sang a new song, drowning confusion in its happy notes, while the flail of Urizen sounded loud in the winnowing wind of Tharmas, so loud, so clear in the wide heavens, and the song they sang was this, composed by an African black from the little earth of Sotha. Aha, aha. How came I here so soon in my sweet native land? How came I here? Methinks I am as I was in my youth, when in my father's house I sat and heard his cheering voice. Methinks I see his flocks, his herds, and feel my limbs renewed. And lo, my brethren in their tents, and the little ones round them. The song arose to the golden feast. The eternal man rejoiced. And the eternal man said, Luva, the vintage is ripe. Arise. The sons of yours and shall gather the vintage with sharp hooks. And all thy sons, O Luva, bear away the families of earth. I hear the flail of yours his barns are full and no room remains. And in the vineyard stand the abounding sheaves beneath the falling grapes that odors burst upon the winds. Arise, my flocks and herds, trample the corn, my cattle. Browse upon the ripe clusters. The shepherds shout for Luva, prince of love. Let the bulls of Luva tread the corn and draw the loaded wagon into the barn while children glean the ears around the door. Then shall they lift their innocent heads and stroke his furious nose, and he shall lick the little girl's white neck and on her head scatter the perfume of his breath, while from his mountains high the lion of terror shall come down, and bending his bright mane and couching at their side shall eat from the curled boy's white lap his golden food, and in the evening sleep before the door. Attempting to be more than man, we become less, said Luva as he arose from the bright feast, drunk with the wine of ages. His crown of thorns fell from his head. He hung his living lyre behind the seat of the eternal man and took his way, sounding the song of loss, descending to the vineyards bright. His sons arising from the feast with golden baskets follow. A fiery train as when the sun sings in the ripe vineyards. Then Luva stood before the wine press. All his fiery sons brought up the loaded wagons with shoutings. Ramping tigers play to the jingling traces. Furious lions sound the song of joy to the golden wheels circling upon the pavement of heaven. And all the villages of Luva ring. The golden tiles of the villages reply to violins and tabors to the pipe, flute, lyre, and cymbal. Then fell the legions of mystery and maddening confusion down, down to the immense with outcry, fury and despair into the wine presses of Luva. Howling fell the clusters of human families through the deep. The wine presses were filled. The blood of life flowed. Plentiful odors of life arose all around the heavenly arches, and the odors rose singing this song. O terrible wine presses of Luva, O oh, caverns of the grave, how lovely the delights of those risen again from death. A trembling joy, excess of joy is like excess of grief. So sang the human odors round the wine presses of Luva. But in the wine presses is wailing, terror, and despair. Forsaken of their elements, they vanish and are no more. No more but a desire of being. A distracted, ravening desire, desiring like the hungry worm and like the gaping grave. They plunge into the elements. The elements cast them forth or else consume their shadowy semblance. Yet they obstinate, though pain to distraction, cry, oh, Let us exist, for this dreadful non-existence is worse than pains of eternal birth. Eternal death, who can endure? Let us consume in fires and waters stifling, or in airs corroding, or in earth shut up. The pangs of eternal birth are better than the pangs of eternal death. Now how red the sons and daughters of Luva, how they tread the grapes, laughing and shouting, drunk with odors, many fall or wearied. Drowned in the wine is many a youth and maiden. 
Those around lay them on skins of tigers or the spotted leopard or wild ass till they revive or bury them in cool grots making lamentation. But in the wine presses the human grapes sing not nor dance. They howl and writhe in shoals and torment, in fierce flames consuming, in chains of iron and in dungeons circled with ceaseless fires, in pits and dens and shades of death, in shapes of torment and woe, the plates, the screws, racks, saws, cords, fires and floods, the cruel joy of Luva's daughters lacerating with knives and whips their victims, and the deadly sports of Luva's sons. Timbrels and violins sport round the wine presses. The little seed, the sport of root, the earthworm, the small beetle, the wise emmet dance round the wine presses of Luva. The centipede is there, the ground spider with many eyes, the mole clothed in velvet, the earwig armed, the tender maggot, emblem of immortality, the slow slug, the grasshopper that sings and laughs and drinks. In the winter comes, he folds his slender bones without a murmur. There is the nettle that stings a soft down, and there the indignant thistle, whose bitterness is bred in his milk and who lives on the contempt of his neighbor. There are all the idle weeds that creep around the obscure places, show their various limbs, naked in all their beauty, dancing round the wine presses. And they dance around the dying and they drink the howl and groan. They catch the shrieks and cups of gold, they hand them to one another. These are the sports of love, and these the sweet delights of amorous play, tears of the grape, the death sweat of the cluster, the last sigh of the mild youth who listens to the luring songs of Luva. And the eternal man darkened with sorrow, in a wintry mantle covered the hills. He said, O Tharmas, rise, and O Erthona. And then Tharmas and Erthona rose from the golden feast, satiated with mirth and joy. Erthona limping from his fall, and Tharmas leaned. In his right hand his hammer. Tharmas held his shepherd's crook, beset with gold. Gold were the ornaments formed by the sons of Urizen. Then Anian, and Ahania, and Vala, and the wife of dark Erthona rose from the feast in joy, ascending to their golden wombs. There the winged shuttle sang, the spindle and distaff and the reel rang sweet the praise of industry through all the golden rooms. Heaven rang with winged exultation, all beneath howled loud, with tenfold rout and desolation roared the chasms beneath, where the wide woof flowed down, and where the nations are gathered together. And Tharmas went down to the wine presses, and beheld the sons and daughters of Luva quite exhausted with the labor, and quite filled with new wine, that they began to torment one another, and to tread the weak. And Luva and Vala slept on the floor, or wearied. Erthona called his sons around him, Tharmas called his sons numerous. They took the wine, they separated the lees, and Luva was put for dung on the ground by the sons of Tharmas and Erthona. They formed heavens of sweet wood, of gold, of silver, and ivory, of glass, and precious stones. They loaded all the wagons of heaven and took away the wine of ages with solemn songs and joy. Luva and Vala woke, and all the sons and daughters of Luva awoke. They wept to one another, and they reascended to the eternal man in woe. He cast them wailing into the world of shadows through the air, to winter is over and gone. But the human wines stood wondering in all their delightful expanses. The elements subside, the heavens rolled on with vocal harmony. Then Loss, who is Erthona, rose in all his regenerative power. The sea that rolled and foamed with darkness and the shadows of death vomited out and gave up all. The floods lift up their hands, singing and shouting to the man. They bow their hoary heads, and murmuring in their channels, flow and circle round his feet. Then dark Erthona took the corn out of the stores of Urizen. He ground it in his rumbling mills. Terrible the distress of all the nations of earth ground in the mills of Erthona. 
In his hand, Tharmas takes the storms. He turns the whirlwind loose upon the wheels. The stormy seas howl at his dread command, and eddying fierce rejoice in the fierce agitation of the wheels of dark Arthona. Thunders, earthquakes, fire, water, floods rejoice to one another. Loud their voices shake the abyss, their dread forms tending the dire mills. The gray hoarfrost was there, and his pale wife, the aged snow. They watch over the fires. They build the ovens of Erthona. Nature and darkness groans, and men are bound to sullen contemplations in the night. Restless, they turn on beds of sorrow in their inmost brain, feeling the crushing wheels. They rise, they write the bitter words of stern philosophy, and knead the bread of knowledge with tears and groans. Such are the works of dark Erthona. Tharmas sifted the corn. Erthona made the bread of ages and placed it in golden and in silver baskets in heavens of precious stones. And then he took his repose in winter, in the night of time. The sun has left his blackness and has found a fresher morning. And the mild moon rejoices in the clear and cloudless night. And man walks forth from the midst of the fires. The evil is all consumed. His eyes behold the angelic spheres arising night and day. The stars consumed like a lamp blown out. And in their stead, behold the expanding eyes of man. Behold the depths of wondrous worlds. One earth, one sea beneath, nor erring globes wander, but stars of fire rise up nightly from the ocean. In one sun each morning, like a new man, issues with songs and joy, calling the plowman to his labor and the shepherd to his rest. He walks upon the eternal mountains, raising his heavenly voice, conversing with the animal forms of wisdom, night and day, the risen from the sea of fire, renewed walk o'er the earth. For Tharmas brought his flocks upon the hills, and in the veils around the eternal man's bright tent, the little children play among the woolly flocks. The hammer of Erthona sounds in the dark, deep caves beneath. His limbs are renewed. His lions roar among the furnaces, and in evening sport upon the plains. They raise their faces from the earth, conversing with the man. How is it that we have walked through fires and yet are not consumed? How is it that all things are changed, even as in ancient times? The sun arises from his dewy bed, and the fresh airs play in his smiling beams, giving the seeds of life to grow, and the fresh earth beams forth ten thousand thousand springs of life. Erthona is risen in his strength, no longer now divided from Enetharmon, no longer the specter of loss. Where is the specter of prophecy? Where the delusive phantom departed, and Erthona rises from the ruinous walls in his ancient strength to form the golden armor of science for intellectual war. The war of swords departed now. The dark religions are departed, and sweet science reigns. End of the dream.